Hello everyone, my name is Richard Tejeda and I'm the founder and executive director of Save by Nature. Today, we're at Sierra Vista Open Space Preserve, which is 1,611 acres of pure beauty. We're with Edward Brooks, a wildlife artist who will be teaching us how to watercolor paint. We'll be hiking along the Sierra Vista Trail above Alum Rock Park and learning about some of the geologic features such as the Calaveras and Hayward Fall. Let's go on a hike and check out this beautiful scenery. Beside San Jose. Here we have a native boring owl, which is a native owl species that burrows on the ground and nests in the ground. It's also called the borrowing owl because it's known to borrow the burrows from squirrels. And squirrels do all the cleaning and do all the digging, and the owl just occupies it. Shell fossils in the Diablo Range are part of a geological group called the Franciscan Complex. The Franciscan Complex is an accretionary complex of sandstones, mudstones, chert, limestone, marine volcanics, and other rocks made up of ocean floor material. Franciscan ocean floor sediments were being scraped up and stuffed up against the continental edge as the Pacific Ocean Plate was being subducted under the American continent. The stuffing of seafloor sediment started in the Jurassic period about 200 million years ago. We have some golden eagles, two golden eagles. What I'm doing is I'm planning to do a painting, a quick sketch, color sketch, of the Sierra Vista view of Penitencia Creek, Aguaque, uh, Arroyo going off towards Joseph de Grant Park. And up on top, in the, in, um, just under the clouds, is Mount Hamilton, the peak of Mount Hamilton. So it's quite a beautiful scene with all these dramatic clouds that have come in in, in recent days and dropped quite a bit of rain on the area. So there's snow on Mount Hamilton right now. So that's necessarily a part of my painting, but I want to get the rocks in the foreground, the mountains in the background, the clouds above, so I'm trying to fit a lot in there. So I do these little sketches to figure out 
what can I fit in my little painting? Can you see that? So that's what we call a thumbnail sketch. It's just a couple inches wide or three inches wide or something like that. And I decide where my horizon's going to go. And I want the mountain tops to be on the top third here, so Mount, Mount Hamilton is going to be there peaking, and the clouds are going to be coming off above it like this. Big cumulus clouds puffing, getting bigger as they get closer towards us. And then down here, we're going to have these ridge, ridges and valleys, ridges and peaks and valleys coming down. Aguaque Creek, and right here, shadow of a big valley, Penitentia Creek here, and right on this little ridge in front of me here, some big boulders. So th this will be sort of the central um, focus of the painting, the big dark shadow of the ridge here, the bright rocks against it. That will make that the center of focus, the highest contrast, okay? And then that's going to be nice and dark in front of us. Lots of reds in the soil. And in the back here, it's going to get bluer and bluer as the ridges go away from me. And then the back where the Mount Hamilton is, I'm going to try to make it purple. So this will be all fairly dark. A bright sky, darkest in the foreground here. And this is called a thumbnail sketch and a value sketch at that. The, the dark shadows of the rock are going to cast across the foreground. And it helps me to figure out where I can fit things before I even get started. And that's all I need, a rough idea of the composition. Value and placement of all my elements. So with that, I'm going to put that down here. I know what I'm doing. And I'm just going to start putting up my paints and get ready to paint. Open my water. I have watercolors, and I have a watercolor pad, and the watercolor pad is a block. It's all taped around the edges so that it stays nice and firm, and it doesn't get buckled when I put water on it. So I can take a bottle of water with a spray and, and just spray it like that, and now I can paint wet on wet. Okay, and that's what I want for those beautiful clouds up there. Normally watercolor artists will work flat so that that all goes, drips, it doesn't drip down, it stays and pulls on the paper. But I can add a little more. And let that sit for a little while. Wet that paper nicely. And when I add some color for the clouds, It's going to get nice and soft, blurry clouds. It's a neat, dark blue sky, isn't it? So I'm going to add some blue to that sky. I'm charging the brush with a lot of blue paint over here on the palette. Trying to get a nice, pretty blue, cerulean blue pool of paint, wet, so that when I put it on, I want to make sure that a, a third of the painting is clouds and sky, so I don't want to make these too big, but I need a nice big blue space up here somewhere, roughly like that. Here comes the eagle, right in the blue sky, beautiful, okay, and you can see that it's looking soft already. We're getting that soft effect because of the, the beautiful wet-on-wet -wet technique, which is so quintessentially... And I'm just going to rough those lower parts of the clouds in there. Mix up a little alizarin crimson with some of that cerulean and get a beautiful purple. And I'm going to use that because these are wet rain clouds and they have purple shadows underneath them. Our left side of the cloud is, oh that's an eagle's shadow, <laughs> racing past us. Ah, 
What a beautiful day. What a be there goes the eagle, swooping down out of the sky. All right, so there's my clouds. Left side is in shadow. Beautiful. And now I'm going to put a cobalt blue with a bit of that purple. That's a different blue. I don't know if you can see that on the palette now. It's, it's a very pretty combination, these blues and, and purples. And then I'm going to use that to suggest the mountain with the snow up in the back here against this purple. So the mountain is going to be coming up to about this high. And I'm going to have to leave a little white in there as that eagle is coming back. And I'll blue that down a bit in a little while. But there's the mountain in the back. That's the hint of it. Okay, so that's where it will be. And I'll add some more details later when it's not wet. Now I'm going to start to add some of that green in the foreground here. I'm going to trap it first so that I don't overdo the... amount of valley I put in there. I want to put some yellow and green down in the foreground here just to trap it so that it don't go too far down. So this is where the hill is coming up and the rocks are going to be. Just to make it pretty, that little bit of yellow. And I'm going to add some purple for the rocks, rock shadows in here, in here, in here, cutting across and draw the outline of the rocks. Suggesting a completely different color scheme to the grasses. Okay. And then for the ground, I can add a little reds, and I'm going to introduce that with a sienna rather than red, which is a type of brown. There we go, this one. This one here, it's more of a fancy orangey brown. Just to enrich those yellows and greens. Okay, so that's a foreground color scheme. And again, I can come in here and add more detail. But I just want to sort of lay it down in light colors. Watercolorists work from light to dark so that when they make a mistake with the dark, it's um, not going to be in the wrong place. If you make a mistake with dark early on, it's going to ruin your painting. So you want to build, and that way you get more confidence where you put your darks. You can start to see where the details go by drawing light first. So I'm going to draw the tops of the mountains over there in a sort of a yellow-green, but not too yellow. I want it to fall back, so I'm going to add a touch of blue to it. So that it falls back further than these foreground greens. And there's that mountain above Aguaque Creek. These are the valleys coming off. There's another hill coming down in here. And then this is above Alum Rock Park over here. And this one's going to have a nice shadow on the side. This is the north slope of the peak above Alum Rock. And that north slope is always in shadow at this time of year, in winter time. And that's why there are all these trees on that slope and there's grasses on the, uh, the south facing slopes. So down in there we want to have a darker green. And I'll just use more of a sage green to put an idea of where the trees are. And the trees down in there, there's a lot of gray pine, some oaks, and a lot of bay. Trees. There's a valley going up there. And this, this green is actually quite perfect for bay trees especially. The gray pine would be more of a blue color. And then after I've done this green, I'm going to add in some shadows. 
to get that north slope shadow effect, wintertime shadows. So the trees are coming down on the north slope here, down into the valley, Penitentia Creek. Leave the rocks, there's a rock. I left the light on the top of the rock. You can see over here onto my right that the rocks actually have a bit of light on top. So I need to try to leave some of that. These are the trees on the other side. And again, I'm going to leave the rocks. There's the light on top of the rocks. There. Okay. There's the trees. And so that, in general, is my design. I'm going to put some hills in the back here with a little more blue even than that. So it's green, but it's more of a blue-green. So it falls back. That's too dark. But not too, too bad. And a little brighter in here. There we go. And I think that's that. So now, on the far side, down the valley, there's some I can see the Santa Cruz Mountains in the back. Oops, that got grayed down. Let's add a little purple to that. More blue. That's the suggestion of the, the valley there. And I'll work with it. I can improve it. It's a little too dark. I soften the edge up, lift some. All right, so that's the color scheme. How's that look, Richard? All right, and now what I'll do is add some details to pick out what's going on in the uh, background first, bringing the foreground last, the details in the foreground last. So I'm going to switch from my larger brush to a slightly smaller brush to do details. Missing other. Oh, so these are these are my round brushes and pointed brushes, and so I'm gonna use these from now on for most of the detail. And they have the shape of trees. You can see that could be a same shape of a pine tree with a pointy top. So I can use them to just lay down shapes. And then for the mountain in the back, I want to just, I'm going to go small so I can just do the detail pretty quickly. Cobalt blue or even darker blue. This is an uh, ultramarine blue. And that ultramarine, I can drop some shadows while this mountain is still. That's too small a brush. Go with a larger brush, ultramarine blue. And shadows in the valley here. Oh, it's dry already in the sun. It's drying out. And ridge top. Some trees up there. That's a little too dark. Oh, and then right here you have Copernicus Peak, I think it's called, with the Mount Hamilton staple of the observatory on it. The road going past it there. And I'm just going to suggest a couple more observatories right there. And down the other side of the mountain, there's the shadow of the mountain. shadow on that side. Trees suggested in blue. So in painting you have blue mountains in the distance because of the atmospheric perspective. Everything seems blue in the distance. Red as you get closer and more, more warm colors forward. Cool colors in the back, especially blue. Okay, suggestion of trees, just a little dots to give us the idea that there are trees on there. But that's that's the mountain effect there. And over here, I'm just going to put some 
valleys, hillsides, suggestion of trees. Okay, so for now that's going to be the end of that. That's my mountain in the background. Suggestions of trees on the top. And in the next step forward, again I'll, I'll use blue, but I'm going to add a little red to that blue. So purple are the same color, but I'm going to add a little purple to it. So it comes forward just a touch more. That's the trick with art. You can have perspective in color. And so that helps to give it the illusion of depth. There's a ridge over here running this way in the background. And it's got shadows falling on the north slopes. So they run down into the valleys like that. I'm going to add a little green to send it back. But they're purple, so they fall back behind this foreground ridge. Okay, so that's good. And now, the next ridge is this one over here. Again, I'll use that same purpley blue. So that's in line with that mountain there and forward of that mountain. So that should be a little more purple than the peak of Copernicus Peak. And no, that one goes above the mountain, but I can't do it my composition, so I'll just keep it down low. There's a shadow of cloud going that way, shadow north side slope. And that's not great, but that'll work. Okay, and now for this closer ridge, I'm going to switch up to more greens rather than the blues. The darker blues in the shadows will come later, but for now I'm just going to stick to more yellow greens and sage greens and a little bit of red in the greens and that's going to bring it forward. But it's going to be more greens. So I'm going to get a little darker than I had before. Add a little bit of brown to a sage just to get some of that chaparral on the slope that has that sort of brown coloring over here. Chaparral over here, chaparral, and then this is just green for now, but I can also make it prettier and add just a touch of some red or something to make it prettier. Browns are nothing but green and red. There we go, that's prettier. And, oh, there's a swift and a hang glider, a parachutist. Huh. Okay, so, bring the greens back, sorry, to distract you like that. I'm going to add a little yellow to my greens and into the bottom of the hills here. Richen that up a little bit. That might be a bit too much. Enrichment. But there we go. So that's the valley of Aguaque Creek, and that's the front ridge in above Alum Rock Park, with the peak coming over like this. Shadows on the top of the grasses like that. That's pretty. And then these greens now become my shadow greens, running down the west slope and there we go, there, there, there. Some trees there. Suggest so some more trees. And I'm using the shape of the brush now. There's that tree shape. That's fun. I think it's starting to come together. And then when I darken up the shadows down in there, it'll look really cool. Over here, I'm going to add a little more green, sage green. Blue it down a bit. We're down in the valley here, so it's going to be darker blues, bluer blues. Shadow blues, shadow green, sorry, are bluer. 
or you know, purples and, and blues and shadows. Warm shadows are purples, cool shadows are blues, and these are quite quite blue. So I want to surround my rocks here. At this point I'm going to get the shape of this foreground ridge more clear in my image. So I want to have my rocks more distinct. Like that. There we go. Trees. And then that really dark shadow going down there, I'm going to use an indigo, which is this really dark. Can you see that blue there? It's almost a black blue. And that's going to give me a shadow, heavy shadow, within these greens. I'm just going to pocket in there, leaving bits of trees. Eagle swooping coming straight at us, down below, down, right over here on the right, above our rock. Up, 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 down. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm back to my painting. And down in here, I just want to suggest some grasses maybe, some texture of the plants, and then make it otherwise just... That's a cold bottom of it. You can find ice in some of these valleys because they don't see the sun during the day at all. On the north slope, during the winter. All right, so going up that side, there's a more of a shadow on one side of the ridge than the other. Indigo down in here to suggest that there's more shadow on this side of that hill. Okay, and I'm coming all the way down here like this. This is a rock rock, grasses, something like that, and then shadows on this side of the trees. And I don't want any lights in the shadows, so I'm going to get rid of all these whites that I had there. All right, so can you see the Composition coming along, right? All right, I'll, I'll lighten that up a little bit. That's too dark. peaks. Quite yellow green. And this one runs like that. Like that. And that one runs. That actually fills in completely. That one runs this way. Up. 
more yellow. As it gets higher, it gets yellow. Varying your colors really helps. So I varied the green from blue green to yellow green, from shadow green to sun green, brighter as it get closer to the top. So the ridges are in sun and you can enhance that. I can, I can then take my flat and if I wanted to enhance that, get a nice bright yellow, say, to pop that peak. But this is a more of a lemon yellow than a cadmium, which is a bright lime or lemon yellow. And then I can just sort of pop that green like that. Ties it all together too with the shadows. But it adds a little sunlight on the peaks. And that pops against the, the blue, it makes the blue even more pretty when you put it next to something like that. It's contrast. Okay, there comes the, the wind. Pop a little yellow there. That's nice. Okay, so we got the background, the sky, the mid-ground, pretty well laid down. I mean, you can always add more detail, but it's, it's coming together. And now I just need to bring details to the foreground to add that focus, that central focus. And so I need to add cracks to the rocks and shapes to the rocks and shadows to the rocks. Shadows in the foreground are going to be probably purple shadows rather than blue shadows. The purples are redder, so these are what you call warm shadows. And so I'm going to make up a nice purple, alizarin crimson purple shadow, something really rich and pretty. Rich, I don't know if you can see that, but it's almost like a magenta color. And that will be my beginning of my shadow side of the rocks here. So I can darken those shadows. That's a little bit dark. I'll add a little bit of water to lighten that up. But it's good. You want, you want dark shadows. It's going to add the contrast you need to give the drawing a pretty high contrast um, scheme. All right, so here goes. That's the shadow side of the rock. Lots of shadow on that rock. Cast the shadow across the ground like that. And you see I'm shaping these shadows. I'm making pretty shapes pretty colors and I can vary the colors. I can add blues to those shadows later and that'll make it even prettier. And then over here, this rock here, I want it to be more rounded on this side. Shadow, shadow rock going that way up. And then on this one here as well, that's a very big shadow there. Cast around on the ground like that. And then in the foreground here, maybe another rock with a shadow like that. And so the rocks have become pretty and central to the painting and hopefully that will give the painting even more interest. If I do it right. So there we go. So we've got reds and yellows and greens in the foreground and it's got light on the tops of the rocks and now I can add some shadow details. I'm going to bring some blue shadows, deep indigo blue, hopefully a little bit of... Um, that's more of a phthalo blue there. That'll, uh, that'll be like a black. It'll be contrasting with the reds. So these are for the deepest shadows and the deepest cracks. I might actually richen that up with red. It's a little too blue. Bring that over there, add some details there. There's the heaviest shadow on the rock there. Details on the grounds. So we're sketching, we're not doing a finished painting, but it's going to be a, a good memory of the color scheme and the composition. And you can always finish it up at home. And 
and I'm going to add a rock down here. And I did a, ooh, what was that? That was a hawk flew by. Okay. What do you think, Richard? Coming along? Absolutely. I'm going to have the valley down in here, so I'm going to really pick up this distinct difference with the valley floor, which is going to be the darkest shadow of all. And I'm using that indigo down in there to push that valley floor back down into the the hole that it sits in. These mountains have a knife cut going right through them, probably something to do with the faulting system. That's a Calaveras fault over there. Okay. Well, i got to start. And I'm just going to see if I can take a break and come back and see what I need to do to... Do you want to look at the fossils or anything like that? Or you've, you've done that already? Yeah, no. do, you want to, do you want to take a break? Well, I was thinking it might need to um, have some washes that needs to dry. Okay. And then I can come back and... So, for instance, let's say this hill here, it's a little too light so that the rocks don't stand up. Let me show you what I'll do there. I'll take a wash and I have to think, okay, what do I want it to be? Do I want it to be warm so it comes forward of the hills? Do I want it to be cool or set back? And I'm thinking, I want those hills to be back and cool, because to me, it's this foreground here that is really all the warmth in the painting. And I don't want it to clash, so to, in order to make things pop and come forward, you need to separate them. And I'm just going to clean up this palette a little bit here. And to separate them, you want to make them different. You know, dark and light. Red and blue. They're opposites, right? And so in art, we use that a lot to try to find a way to make things come forward, to suggest depth. And for this painting, the depth is going to be with this blue. So I chose this pretty blue to do the sky. Well, a lot of atmospheric depth is pretty much putting the sky between us and the hill. That's what we're doing. And that's why everything is blue. It's like you have air between us and the air is blue. Or it has that bluing effect anyhow. So what I can do is I'll just go like this. A wash. I don't know if you see that. But I have made that bluer just by putting a thin wash over it and that sets it back. So let's do that again. I don't want to do the top. I wanted that top to stay warm. I'm just going to do it down in the valley here. Add that little bit of blue. Well, I can take that top and wash most of it with blue. Same thing with that other hill. Send that back. That's too, too white. Send that hill back by just washing it with a little atmosphere, a little sky. Like that. And boom, it goes back. Same thing with this hill in the back. I'm going to wash that. Leave some parts of it light and white. But now that hill and that hill go together. The, the white of the snow on the peak, hopefully, will stand out more clearly and the mountain falls back further. Does that look a little more like snow now? It's not perfect, but it, it's a memory, right? That hill is a little too purple. Again, I can wash it with a little sky blue. And when that white goes away, the hill falls back. That mountain ridge there falls back. So all, all of the mountains, now that part here is more of a family. It's all tied in with that blue atmospheric depth. Okay, now this part here in the front, I can tie it in together by adding a little red or a little yellow. So let's add both. I'm going to add some yellow to this side, wash with yellow, and to this side over here, 
I'm going to wash with a little bit of cadmium red and hopefully I won't overdo it. <laughs> But that'll just pink up the ground there a bit, yellow up the ground, and then blend it together. And that sort of, sorts of, of ties it all together as foreground. And it pops, it makes it interesting. It's prettier to have it shifting from one color to the next than to have just a one color alone. And now the rocks still look flat to me, but I think I know what I need to do to them. I need to add a little orange. The rocks are just too boring. So I'm gonna add a little orange to the sunlight on top of them. It'll tie it in with the ground. So they look like part of the ground. Okay, and now I want to add some details. And so I'm going to take my fine brush. The last thing you do in the painting is the foreground. And now I can add grasses, little green grasses. So I can come in here and say, pick up my green and say I want some grasses in here. Suggest, you don't have to do every blade, but just suggest the, the texture of grasses and people will know what you've done, what you're suggesting. It's like a language and this is our alphabet is shapes of strokes and this letter that I'm doing here, this I, this is, it suggests grass texture, okay? It's a vertical streak, small, there. So that, that suggests a texture. On the rocks, I want to have a little more texture and it's more of a brown, um, a reddish brown or something. Uh, in the purplish brown, maybe it's got a bit of shadow in it, so. I'm going to just use a brown, and I'm going to say this got pox. It's got cracks. That's a rock. So it's got to have rough texture. So I'm just adding some of that. Cracks. And then add it in the shadows and in the light so it all comes together in the end. And then I'll add some more in the shadows that are darker to separate it. I'm going to carry some of that texture down into the ground here to suggest gravel, stones. And again, it's a sketch. I'm going to bring some of that over here to make it all family with this side of the painting. Voila. Can you see it well? I didn't even ask. And I think that's going to be it for that painting for now. I can finish up in the studio. I have photographs that I took earlier. And so any details. And, and it's nice to stand back from something. I'm too close right now and look at it again. And in the studio, out of the sun, out of the wind. Okay, well that's it for today. I'm Edward Rooks and this program was brought to you by the Urban Open Space Grant.